uh, we're trained to read the text canonically, right? We are trained to read it as a continuous whole thought. And so we gloss over uh, the sharp sort of abrupt shift that happens between Genesis one and Genesis two. Now, if you ask some random person to tell you how creation worked in the Bible, everyone's like, oh yeah, it's easy, right? Uh, right in the beginning, God created. And then there's days one, two, three, four, five, six. And on day seven, God rested. And then Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. It's like, like, yes, that's the order of the text, but how did that, how does that work? Those things don't actually go together. We get in Genesis two, a very, very different picture of creation. So in Genesis one, uh, it opened with this primordial watery chaos, but Genesis two tells us that the earth is dry and dusty at first. In Genesis one, man is created at the, humanity is created at the very end of the process. In Genesis two, of course, humanity is created at the very beginning. Uh, in Genesis one, uh, humanity is created and told to fill the whole earth, right? And then in Genesis two, weirdly, man is restricted just to this one garden and isn't being, isn't really filling the earth anymore. Besides, how is that one dude supposed to fill the earth all by himself anyway? Uh, in Genesis one, animals are created before humanity. In Genesis two, they're created after and on behalf of, for the sake of humanity. In Genesis one, of course, male and female created simultaneously. Uh, in Genesis two, also famously, uh, females are created from the side of uh, that one dude who happens to be hanging around. In Genesis one, creation takes six days. In Genesis two, it's just one day where it all happens. How do we explain these differences? Uh, more than differences, how do we explain these outright contradictions? Uh, both of these accounts can't really be true in a literal sense, right? Um, right? Both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 can't have happened quite. Uh, so we might try to interpret these contradictions away, right? We might say, as traditions have for a long time, that Genesis 1 is sort of more this like spiritual notion of creation, and Genesis 2 is actually the physical creation, right? How it, it really happened. Um, we can say that. We could come up with all sorts of, we could say, you know, Genesis 1 happened, and then fast forward a while, and now we're into Genesis. You can do all sorts of, uh, of sort of uh, twists and turns to make it work, but anything we say in order to sort of relieve the contradictions between the two texts is admitting that there are contradictions between the two texts, right? Uh, in the attempt to level Genesis one and Genesis two into a single coherent story is actually reading against the biblical text, right? The Bible gives us two creation stories, two very different creation stories with different claims about what happened and when and how and why, right? The whole thing. Uh, and you know, there's not just, right, there's bigger stuff involved here, right? You could make whole arguments about the environmental movement based on Genesis uh, one, where you know the, everything in the world is created before humanity and uh, the animals are, are told to be fruitful and multiply even before people are, right? So animal rights is in there too. Uh, you could do gender equality questions, right? There's vast, vast differences between the two stories, not just in their details, but in their big, larger imports. Um, you can't really combine them in such a way that does justice to each of them as their own thing. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to talk more about Genesis 2 on its own terms next time. Uh, here, I really want to just introduce the notion that the Bible, even in the first two chapters, has multiple authors, uh, multiple authors with different ideas and different traditions and different stories and themes and theology. And and that's not just okay, it's more than okay. It's actually central to what the Bible is and to what Genesis is. And I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i come back to this more in a couple of weeks. But I wanna note that we are like so culturally trained to blend stories into a single sort of lowest common denominator narrative that we, like even when they don't actually work together, we still do this and end up missing some stuff. Um, you know, Genesis 2 is obviously all about the creation of the first man and the first woman, man first and woman second. And Genesis 1, as we saw, had simultaneous creation of male and female. And here's the fun part, right? Because we have all mentally done a thing in combining these two stories. 
and therefore uh, and therefore missed, I think, like a really cool part of Genesis one. The question is this: How many humans did God create in Genesis one? The obvious answer is two, right? God created two humans, male and female. But why do we think that God only created two humans in Genesis one? Right? God created before the humans. God created all the fish. Right, all the different kinds of fish. Do we think that God created like two salmon and two trout, like male and female and two shrimp and just like, only two? Or did, then God created the land animals, just like two cows and two horses and two elephants, two eagles and two sparrows, right? That's all God created on, on day one. I don't think actually most of us even really think that. I think we understand that when God created all of the other bits of the animal kingdom in Genesis one, he created entire species. God's starting to populate the earth. And God says, be fruitful and multiply, N not because there's just two of them, but as a blessing, right? May you continue to increase and fill the earth. So when God creates humanity and creates not individual, but the species, humanity, and creates the male and female and says, I'm blessing you, be fruitful and multiply, how many humans did God create? Not two, God created the entire species of humanity on day six of Genesis one. So why do we instinctively reading Genesis one go, oh yeah, male and female created two, right? Just two individuals. Why do we think that? Because we think that Genesis one is talking about the two individuals from Genesis two, but we know it isn't. I mean, they're totally different stories. And besides in Genesis two, he doesn't create two male and female at the same time, but only one, and then eventually gets around to another one, right? These stories may be next to each other, but that's all they are. They're just next to each other. And we as readers blend them together, usually not so well, but we shouldn't blend them into a single story. The Bible doesn't blend them into a single story, right? We get one take on creation, and then we get another take on creation. Okay, so my final thought for today we need as readers to be constantly conscious about where and how we're imposing our own interpretive frameworks onto the text. And with any luck, part of what we're gonna do over the next uh, few weeks together is become more aware of just how present and prominent our interpretive frameworks are in our understanding of Genesis.